Hey, City on a Hill, how are we doing? Good to have you join us. Welcome, a special welcome if you are new or visiting. My name's Nick. Get the joy of being the pastor of this church that God is building to know Jesus and make Jesus known. Uh, today we're going to continue the Sermon on the Mount. Who's been enjoying the series? Who's been challenged by the series? Even more hands for the second one. Uh, it has been challenging and it is so influential of a sermon that we are talking about it all these years later, 2,000 years later. That is the dream for every preacher, uh, for the, the impact to be that. Uh, before we dive into it, I uh, wanted to let you know something and celebrate with you something. That is that we are tomorrow launching a new GC in Croydon North, of all places. Come on, everybody. Let's put our hands together for Lucas and Amelia Willig, who are launching that. We have some people join us all the way from the northeast. Uh, and so if that's you or you know someone kind of... You know, there or thereabouts, uh, please do let them know that there is a GC starting in their area. We'd love to have you connect to others. Uh, So let's prepare our hearts to begin with for what God has to say for us this morning. Let's pray together. God Almighty, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is true and we pray that you would now sanctify us in your truth. Lord, point us to King Jesus, that we would see him clearly, that we would know him more wholeheartedly, uh, that we would trust him more fully. And so, Lord, come and do what only you can and and change our hearts. We can't conjure up, change ourselves. We need you to come and do it and point us to Jesus, we pray. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Well, if uh, you have been here in recent weeks, you will know that uh, for a couple of weeks now, we have seen in the Sermon on the Mount that we've been in a part of it uh, that's really focused in on the fatherhood of God. If Matthew chapter 5 could be summarized in one word, probably the word fulfillment, uh, because we learned that we don't get Jesus by pursuing righteousness, we pursue Jesus and we get righteousness. Then in chapter 6, uh, we started to see more and more about this fatherhood of God. And today, uh, we see that this father loves us, cares for us, is so compassionate toward us that He wants to enter in and help us navigate the complexities of life. And so specifically today, Jesus is going to challenge us away from and counsel us in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of worry. Uh, It was relevant back then, and perhaps it's even relevant today, because we live in a day that could be called the age of anxiety. Part of that is because today we have an increasing awareness and and knowledge of the the science and uh, research that's gone into mental health uh, that shows that some anxiety is is attached to biology and to chemistry. Uh, I've read that one in four Australians are going to be impacted by that kind of anxiety in their lifetime. Uh, And so it's important with that kind of anxiety to seek medical help and and get uh, input into dealing with it. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is going to go after uh, not so much our biology, but our theology. And He's going to go after the kind of everyday anxiety, everyday worry that you or I or anyone might experience in our life. Because there is, uh, this time of of life or, or this year after the year that we've had and we've got PTSD from, there's a lot to worry about. You can worry about the past, the present, the future, our jobs, our finances, our health, our relationships, our families, our kids, our friends, our churches. You can worry about anything and everything. And doesn't that observation alone tell us that worry itself, anxiety itself, is not so attached to circumstance or situation, but it flows from something else. It flows from our hearts, who are in every one of those relationships or circumstances. And so today, Jesus is going to speak to our heart, and He's going to speak into our life. He is going to diagnose the cause of our worries give us the antidote for our worries and then point us to a substitute for our worries. And so I'm going to move through the text, so please do join me in Matthew chapter 6. If you're not there already in a Bible or a smartphone, we're going to move through this and look at these three headings, the first of which is the causes of our worries. We'll start in verse 19. Uh, To get us up to speed, Jesus has been talking about hypocrisy, religious hypocrisy, and then he flips to start talking about anxiety. And we'll see that there's actually some similarities between the two as we go through it. But before he dials in, he wants to share some bigger reflections about life and our human experience in it by talking about our hearts and our eyes. Our hearts and our eyes. And we know that we're talking here about causes of anxiety because in a moment, 
Jesus is going to say, therefore, do not be anxious. Now, whenever you read in the Bible the word therefore, you want to ask, wherefore the therefore? Or what is the therefore, therefore? It's because it's telling us that there's something before it that's really significant. And so this is the ground of the anxiety which he'll ask us to not be anxious about later. And so Matthew 6 verse 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so Jesus starts by speaking to our ambitions. Do not lay up, or do lay up. All of us have ambitions. Perhaps you write yours down, perhaps you've printed them out, and you've got them next to your, your mirror in the bathroom to kind of declare over your day, each and every day. Or perhaps you're someone who kind of keeps it to yourself, or perhaps you don't even articulate them at all within yourself. They just kind of lead you, because all of us are led by priorities we have or things that we value. And here Jesus says, we're not just kind of all got values, we're actually led by what we find valuable, by treasure. And whatever you do value, he says, that's where your heart is. Now, when I was a teenager, uh, I really valued video games, Uh, specifically achieving the sporting glory that I never could in real life. And there's one story that stands out to me that exposes just how much I treasured video games because I was playing the game FIFA. And so for the uneducated, that is a soccer uh, game. And I think it must have been FIFA World Cup 2002, so we're going back a few years here, Uh, something like that. Whatever game it was, it was completely meaningless. But you wouldn't have known that it was completely meaningless if you just looked at how I was responding and reacting in the midst of playing it. Because from memory, I took Australia, the Socceroos, into the World Cup final against Brazil. And so this was an epic achievement for a young teenager. And I took them into the grand... the the World Cup final. And this was a very tense moment, this World Cup final. My heart rate was through the roof. M&M's Lose Yourself was kind of like my, my soundtrack here internally. My palms were sweaty, my knees were weak, my arms were heavy. The kind of moment when you are just kind of fidgety and annoyed if anyone else walks into the room. I was all in on this moment. And so in the World Cup final, in the dying moments of the game, the last minute, the 90th minute of the game, which was really about 15 seconds because it was four minute and a half or something like that, I scored the match-winning goal. I scored the match-winning goal for the Socceroos to historically beat Brazil. And what happened in my joy, in spite of it being completely meaningless, in spite of it meaning absolutely nothing, being totally inconsequential, a virtual world, a virtual reality, a video game, it had taken control of me. And as I scored that goal, I jumped up off the couch in my parents' living room and I went like a bigger than Leighton Hewitt, kind of like, come on, punch of the air. And what I completely forgot about in my joy was that there was a chandelier right there in the midst of the living room. And the chandelier went smash everywhere, glass all over the whole living room. And as I did it, my dad was walking in from coming home from work and there was a big get bang and glass absolutely everywhere. And so my hand hurt. My dad was ticked off. The room was a mess. I had the game to finish. <laughs> and all of this peripheral complexity and damage over an inconsequential game in a made-up virtual world with a meaningless accomplishment that I would forget the following week until I could bring it up years later in a sermon. <laughs> I had been completely absorbed by this. And it had actually changed my emotions. It changed me physically. It it caught me up into the narrative with which this virtual world had created for me. It impacted my relationships with my dad. It impacted my home. And Jesus is saying that something similar can happen to us when our hearts are absorbed with the things of this world. That from eternity, we might look back at our life right now, as I do, looking back at my 14-year-old self and think, what was I stressing about? It was completely meaningless, inconsequential. And so Jesus here says, do not store up or lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. And when he says treasures on earth, he's not merely talking about gold or money. 
He will turn to that in a moment. But rather, really, anything of this world. He's talking about anything that doesn't extend beyond earth. So think about that here. Maybe career aspirations or your resume, your home, your financial goals, your investments, your sporting passions, your achievements, your Strava stats. Jesus is saying, do not be ambitious for these things, which will either be lost or broken or depreciate so much that they'll become worthless. Rather, be ambitious. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Be ambitious about heaven. And when Jesus says treasures in heaven, he's not saying that there's this kind of specific eternal investment account that you are now paying dividends into, because that would just be perpetuating the problem that he's going after at the moment, this kind of materialism, worldly pursuit. Rather, he's instead referring to everything caught up in following Jesus. Pursuing the kingdom of heaven is following Jesus. Jesus is the treasure. So be ambitious about that is what he's saying. And so our anxieties and our, our worries, they, they flow from what it is that we are pursuing, what we're trying to lay up, where we are storing our heart. And this is, this is what Jesus says next, only using a different analogy. In verse 22, he says, The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. And so Jesus is saying that our vision of the world will impact the way that we live in it. Our vision of the world will impact what we think is most valuable. If we value the right things, then our whole body spiritually is going to be healthy, full of light. We'll have a purity about ourselves. It will be transparent. If we value the wrong things, our whole body spiritually will be dark. And so it's similar to the first point, that how you see the world, what's valuable, that's what will impact your life. Now, we live in a day where we are constantly taught and told that not only are the treasures of earth earth most valuable, but the treasures of earth are all there is to be ambitious about. In his uh, book, John Stott uh, writes in a book, Why I Am a Christian, uh, he brings up the writings of a philosopher, Theodore Rozak, a writer who wasn't a Christian, yet he highlighted the flaws in this common thinking that we are all schooled in, this materialistic worldview. And he refers to what he calls the coca colonization of the world, and wrote that we are all suffering today from a psychic claustrophobia within the scientific worldview. And in with it, and the claustrophobia causes us, our human spirit cannot breathe, because when we're cut off from transcendence, we shrivel. And so the material world of objective science, of only recognizing the visible world, of only prioritizing the treasures of earth, the things of this world, this is not merely not nearly spacious enough for the human spirit. And so when your days are only and always ever about earning money to pay the bills, to make the investments, to earn more money, to upgrade the car, to go to a nicer restaurant, to then go to the footy on the weekend, to then wake up on Monday to, to, Monday to earn more money, uh, to then save for the house deposit, to get the house, which then needs the renovations and so on and so forth, our hearts were made for so much more. Our hearts were made for something bigger. Our hearts were made for something lasting, for something eternal. And so Jesus is pointing out that all of us can be like me as a 14-year-old, to be sucked in to this world that won't go beyond itself. And so our stresses and our emotional heaviness and our relational strains and our worries, so often they are a symptom or a consequence of this spiritual claustrophobia caused by thinking that this world is all there is and our hearts are stuck in it. So Jesus then says in in verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so then he goes a bit further and says, you are definitely going to be devoted to whatever it is that you treasure. Your vision of the world will, give, will be what you give your life to. The treasure will be what shapes your heart. And so Jesus is making this big point that the world has a discipleship strategy for you. The world has a plan for you. Your heart is, is malleable. It is impressionable. Your heart's a devotion factory. 
and it manufactures things to love and to treasure. And so much of our worries come from running on the fuel of this kind of approach to the world. And so we need to remind ourselves of reality. We need to remind ourselves of eternity. We need to remind ourselves of theology. And so that's why where Jesus turns to next as he brings up the antidote then to our worry. He says in verse 25, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. And so God the Father watches over you. He knows you, He sees you, He cares for you, and He wants to cure now our anxieties in what Jesus has to say for us. Like a doctor who's kind of poking and prodding at the body, asking questions about, is it this? Does this hurt? He now is going to get to that point of pain and home in on it. Before we get there, it's good to consider anxiety and worry a little bit more fully because uh, this word where Jesus says, therefore, do not be anxious, that word anxious uh, is a word that's used elsewhere in the New Testament, but it's not always used in negative ways. Sometimes it's used in positive ways, like the word concern, like Paul's concern for all the churches that he planted. But we live in a fallen world where our vision of life is distorted and so too are our emotions and our reactions to life so distorted. So what could be a a loving concern can become a self-centered distortion and a worry and an anxiety unnecessarily, particularly about our practical needs. And so this is what Jesus is going to provide the antidote to, to that distorted concern that has become a worry. And He does it by going after our theology. He wants to remind us of a few truths that He wants to come home to us. The first is that He wants us to change our perspective. So verse, the end of uh, verse 25 says, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And so Jesus wants us to lift our vision beyond just food and fashion, to open our spiritual eyes, that there is more to life than what you're worried about. I remember a moment where that uh, struck out for me. Uh, you should know that the Coombs family are very much an Aldi family. Uh, some of you will be Woolworths families and you love those Ushis or Oshis or whatever they are. I don't need those. Some of you will be Coles families and you love the little shopper things. We don't, we don't need those at home. What I need out of a supermarket is to not only get the groceries, but also be able to buy witches' hats, uh, TVs, uh, work tools, whatever you can get. You can get it from Aldi. Uh, it's all there. And so I remember one moment we went to Aldi for a special buy moment. Uh, and it was one of those exclusive special buys because uh, this is when Axel was, was a baby and we needed a rocking chair. And we had heard that these rocking chairs were very exclusive. Uh, and so there'd only be two at the store. And so we wanted to get there right, right and early before Aldi opened. And so we did. We arrived at 8.20 a.m. before the 8.30 start. And uh, I was confident when we first arrived because it looked like it would be all ours. It was just us and a few pensioners who were waiting there to do their early morning shop. And we were kind of sizing each other up. And as you're kind of inching toward 8.30, you're kind of also inching forward to the, to the front door and you're kind of looking at everyone else and you don't want to make any too, too many sudden movements or else someone might panic uh, and kind of just, just go for it. Then 8.29 came around, and the Aldi employee walks around, uh, kind of, and you know there's movement in the store, so you know that door's going to open any time. Uh, and by that time, there was a sizable crowd outside of the Aldi, and uh, the doors opened, uh, and at first I kind of let the older folks go in before me, uh, but then after about two and a half seconds, my patience wore thin and kind of <laughs> made a beeline around them uh, and went on ahead. And so I enter the store, and I move into the aisle that isn't as populated as the other aisles, and uh, head out for the back where the, the special buys are going to be. And as kind of time starts standing still as this happens, and the Tour de France commentator Phil Liggett kind of gets in my head, like, you know, here I am walking, uh, moving, and you want to you walk in a way that is, is rushed, but not so rushed that you lose your dignity. Right? You, know, you, you, you don't look, yeah, you need to maintain your respectability. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm moving, walking, like an Olympic kind of walk up to the back, and there it is, and there is only two of them. And so then I turned into like Samson and fighting the Philistines, like fending them off, pulled down the rocking chair, and I had it. We got the rocking chair. Still got it at home. <laughs> Hours of thinking, minutes of planning, seconds of perspiration, it all came down to that. 
And so I take it up the front, pay for the chair. And what I didn't consider is that rocking chairs are big. They are really big. And so the box was so big that I couldn't actually carry it and walk. I had to kind of push it along the concrete in the car park toward the car. And so I got it up next to the car. I opened the, the passenger, passenger side of the door and, uh-oh, it wasn't going to fit. Move it around to the back. Surely it's going to fit in the boot. Open the boot. Uh-oh, it's not going to fit in the boot. And so I unpack the chair. I take the chair into pieces and try to put it into the car. Still, the main frame, the body of the chair is not going to fit in the car. And so all that I'd worked for, all that I'd accumulated, everything that I'd achieved at the expense of the pensioners and everyone else, and it wasn't going to fit after all of that. Now, I was able to work out a way to get the chair 300 metres home, but don't let that distract you from the moral of the story. Some of you are expending all of your energy, all of your time, working to accumulate things that you're not going to be able to take with you. What are you living for that just is not going to fit into eternity? There is more to life than what you're getting stressed about. There is more to life than the things that you are staying up late at night about. There is more to life than what you're burning the candle at both ends for. Is not more... Is not there more to life than food and clothing? Our scientism, our materialism, our here and now-ism creates this pressure and angst in us. And so we need to open our eyes. We need to lift our vision, change our perspective so that oxygen might enter into our souls as we see the reality of life, that there is more to life than your lifestyle, your car, your house, the mortgage, your job security, your resume, And we feel and sense this, don't we? Whenever kind of eternity enters into the moment and perhaps we have to go to a funeral or something like that, there's a crisis. And we have that that moment of clarity. It's like, hey, there's there's more to life. I'm going to resolve to live my life now differently because of what I've just experienced. And then a week later, we go back because we're being discipled into something. That more to life that Jesus is talking about is that there's Jesus. The more to life is Jesus himself. Because our world is is dripping with meaning beyond the material. You know, you are going to live somewhere forever. You're not just going to move houses, you are going to move paradigms into eternity, forever. And what the good news of the gospel is, is that the God who created forever, and the God who created all the material stuff in the here and now, actually took on material himself, took on flesh and blood and had that flesh pierced and had that blood poured out for you so that you would know him because he wants you to live forever with him. He wants you to live forever with him. And so God has come in the flesh in Jesus to show you that there is more to life than all that you can see, taste, touch and smell in the here and now. God wants you to be with him. And when that happens, our priorities in life should change. There should be a difference between the priorities of the person who's pursuing Jesus and the priorities of the person who's laying up treasures on earth. And so there is more to life, and that more to life has come for your life to be united with His. That's the first, change your perspective. The second argument Jesus makes is that you should know your value. You should know your value. He turns to talk about the birds And the lilies, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Last week, Jules and I and the kids went to the Hillsville Sanctuary. Who's been to the Hillsville Sanctuary? I had very low expectations of the Hillsville Sanctuary. Uh, I thought it's just kind of a poor man's zoo. It's, a, it's, it's the bird <laughs> sanctuary. Uh, but we went to the marquee event of the Hillsville Sanctuary, which is the bird show. Uh, and I had, again, very low expectations for the bird show. I thought it kind of like a zookeeper would come out holding a parrot, tell us a bit about the parrot. The parrot would go back to the cage. Uh, it was not what I expected. This was an awesome bird show. 
Because these are epic birds that they use, and like they have a couple of zookeepers, and the birds swoop the crowd in between the zookeepers, like right over your head. It's really impressive. Anyway, you should go. And the, the marquee, or the, the, the capstone bird of the show, is this massive wedge-tailed eagle, which is bigger than my two-year-old daughter. Uh, and then throughout the show, they have, they have like advertisements where I can't remember the exact word of the year. It was like wipe for the wild or something. It was about how you've got to buy the right toilet paper to not let these birds become endangered. And yet here Jesus says, for all the impressiveness and for all the energy put into the environmental campaigns to ensure that those birds don't become endangered, for all the, the massiveness and, and hugeness of that eagle, my daughter is infinitely more valuable than those birds. You are more valuable than any bird. You are more valuable than Farlap in the museum, than those dinosaur bones in the museum. You are more valuable than any Californian redwood, which is, is not able to be cut down. And so Jesus says that if God has them, how much more does he have you? If God so looks after the birds, that they, they never go hungry. You know, there is not one single bird in all of the world that has a bank account, not some, one single bird in all of the world that is receiving 9.5% of their salary into superannuation. There is not one single bird or animal in all the world that has life insurance policies, has private health care, and they're not anxious about it because God provides for them. And if God provides for them, He will provide for you. Now, sometimes perhaps He might provide for you through the insurance policy, because one of the gifts he gives us is wisdom uh, to, to, to have these kinds of things. But the point is that God's got you. God's got you. He is going to care for your needs. He is going to provide for you. Do not be anxious. And so the first was change your perspective, know your value. And third, his third argument is trust your father. Trust your father. Verse 31, therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. And so last week we looked at religious hypocrisy and Jesus' rebuke to the religious hypocrites was, hey, don't be a hypocrite because God sees, God hears, God knows. And here it's the same answer to those of us who are anxious. God sees, God hears, God knows. Our world runs on the desire for food, for drink, for clothing. Almost every advertisement you will See, this week, the 3,000 messages you'll get this week, every single day, will be about, probably, food, drink, or clothing. And yet your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. Your Heavenly Father is going to provide for you better than any of those marketing campaigns. Your Heavenly Father has such a love and care and, and fatherly tenderness and compassion toward you that He's got you. You don't need to stress thinking about securing these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And so life is more than food and clothing. You are more valuable than birds and lilies. God is more knowledgeable about what you need than any catalogue, than any marketing campaign you'll ever encounter. And so this is the antidote to our anxiety or to our worry. Get into your worldview that God is like this toward you. Get into your heart the treasure chest of your life, that you have a heavenly Father who knows you, loves you, and cares for you like this. And yet Jesus doesn't even stop there because it goes on. And so we'll close with this. We'll close with what Jesus closes with, the, the substitute of our worry. Because he finishes in verse 33 with, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And so Jesus doesn't just say, hey, therefore, do not be anxious. All right, got it? Cool. No, He wants to replace our anxiety. He wants to replace our worry with something else. That if our ambitions for the things of this world cause these symptoms, worries, He wants us to be ambitious about something else. He wants, or He knows, that we will treasure something. He wants that to be the right thing. And He wants to fan it into flame. An old English preacher named Thomas Chalmers once reflected on how God changes us at our heart level. He said, The heart's desire for an ultimate object may be conquered, but its desire to have some object 
is unconquerable. The only way to dispossess the heart of an old affection is through the expulsive power of a new one. And so in other words, you are always going to treasure something. So you need to make sure, if you're going to see change, that you replace the old something with a new something. And so worldly ambitions produce worldly worries, but an ambition for the kingdom of God and His righteousness will produce in you a freedom, a healthy dependence upon God. That even without all the worry, even without all the stress and the perspiration, God will still provide for you. Because it's not like your worries are twisting His arm. He's going to be your heavenly Father, whether you're worried or not. He's going to care for you, whether you're worried or not. Because His care for you is out of His love for you. And so this is where it ends. This is where we are. It is a question of, what do we love most? What will have our heart most? What will be that expulsive new affection that pushes out the worries and the anxieties? How can we sub out our worries for trust in Jesus? Well, we can do it, as Jesus does here, by recognizing God's loving grace toward us. See, throughout this passage, over and over again, Jesus has shown us how much God has for us in this life. He tells us that you are more valuable than anything else in all of creation. He tells us that God has adopted you into His family, that you can even call Him Heavenly Father, and He's going to provide for you. And that's made more possible when we realize that God's greatest provision is not what's talked about in this sermon, but the one talking the sermon, the one giving the sermon. Because God's greatest provision to you is His own Son, Jesus Himself. In Romans chapter 8, it says, If God, who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? God loves you so much that He gave His only Son. And if He's given you His Son, everything else is is pocket change. Everything else is easy. God has provided Himself for you in Jesus. And so therefore, you need not be anxious. Do not be anxious. Do not worry. Because come what may, God has so shown His love for you in such a profound way by sending His Son to live for you, to die for you, to rise again. That whatever you're going through, whatever circumstance, whatever lack, whatever worry about future lack, you can know by looking to the cross, by looking to Jesus, that God will certainly provide for you again. And so seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness Seek it first, because God has come to seek you out. He has come to seek and save the lost, and He has brought you home to Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for Your loving kindness and generosity toward us. Lord, You have seen us in our sin and not left us there, but provided us salvation. And even now, in the kingdom, You see us with our needs and you provide for us. And so, Lord, help our unbelief. Help us trust in you as a good and loving Heavenly Father who knows what is good for His children. Lord, free us from the trappings. Free us from the anxieties, the stresses that we bring upon ourselves by capping our worldview in the here and now. Free us from the world's discipleship strategy for us that has us living in this room of claustrophobia that will never go beyond itself. Lord, we thank you so much that you have entered in and you have entered in to blow up our world, our our, our world view in such a way that we look beyond today and know that you are going to provide for us today, tomorrow and into eternity as you bring us home to you. And so help us trust in you every step of the way. We love you, Jesus. We pray that you would be with us by your Spirit all the more, that we might trust you wholeheartedly as we enter a new week. Pray this in Jesus' mighty name. All God's people said, Amen.